Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to all have you back, and you've had your coffee and your snacks and whatever, and we're going to get right back into the real food. We're going to get back into Ephesians chapter 3. And for those of you joining us on television, again, we just thank you for everything, and uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, many of you are learning how to study on your own, and nothing thrills us more. And uh, you're sharing it with others. You know, I've always said, you know why most believers do not share their faith? They're unsure of their wisdom. And so rather than get caught and embarrassed, they say nothing. But once we get people grounded in the Word, hey, when these cults come to your door, are they ever lacking for words? Never. Boy, they've got their verses down pat, see? Well, once you get an understanding of the Word, and uh, like I said in the last half hour, and you get an opportunity to share it, then you're ready. And uh, so that's basically why we keep teaching, is to prepare people to share their faith with those that they have opportunity. All right, we're in book number 76, the middle four programs. So those of you out in television, if you're interested in these things, why, give us a call. Okay, back to Ephesians chapter 3. And we're still going to deal with the mysteries all afternoon as we got them here on the board. Now we're going to hit number two, the mystery of Christ. Christ, a secret? Well, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. And uh, we'll just take a good in-depth look at it. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, of course, the verse we really want is verse 3. Is that what I got on the board? 4. Okay, it's 3 and 4. But let's start at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 1 and head for number 4. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for whom? Gentile. Gentile. See, now I didn't rehearse that again the last few programs. We've got to constantly remember, how did Paul end up being the apostle of the Gentiles? Well, you remember back in Matthew chapter 10, as the Lord had just chosen the 12, he gave them marching orders. And what was it? Go not into the way of a Gentile and into the city of Samaritans. Enter you not. Why? Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so the twelve were then later on called the apostles of Israel. Now when Israel kept rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, and they epitomized it when they killed Stephen, who are we introduced to? The next player, Saul of Tarsus. He held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen. All right, now then, when you get into chapter 9, remember, God is dealing with Ananias, who is going to be the go-between. And what does he tell Ananias? I'm going to send this man, Saul of Tarsus, far hence to the Gentile. Now, do you see the difference in the language? Jesus told the twelve, go not to the Gentile, go to Israel. To this apostle, he says, you're going to the Gentiles, and of course, Israel as well. Big difference, big difference. And again, most of Christendom can't get it. That's one of my number one arguments, if I get any in the mail. Where do you get this business of a gospel for the Jew and a gospel for Gentile? Well, just right there. How in the world? If Jesus sent the 12 out into the tribes of Israel, could they preach death, burial, and resurrection? Hadn't happened yet. Nobody had any idea he was going to die. And so they certainly had a different message. But all right, now to the Gentile world then, this man becomes the one and only true apostle of the Gentile. Now, of course, we know that following him came Barnabas and Silas, and the apostle of the Gentiles as this one is. All right, now verse 2. If, what kind of a word is that? Well, there's a possibility you may not have. But if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, me for years and years, you know what that means. Just like God gave Moses the dispensation of law, and Moses took it down to the mountain to Israel, to this apostle, and I think on the same mountain, he gives now the dispensation of the grace of God, and he doesn't qualify just one group over another, but he says, take it to the Gentile world. 
apostles were to Israel, this apostle to the Gentile. All right, now verse 3. Here comes our word. How that by revelation he, God, made known unto me the mystery, the secret. See, that's why I've got it up here with all the others. That he made known unto me the secret, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read, that is, his epistles, <clears throat> you may understand my knowledge, and knowledge brings what? Wisdom. So you can just about put it all together, those words all fit, that you can have knowledge and wisdom and understanding, whereby you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The secret things of Christ that were never understood until revealed to this apostle in plain language. Now, of course, a lot of things were in veiled language back here in the Old Testament in the Gospels, but did they understand it? No, they didn't know what it was all about. In fact, I guess this is a good time to do it, honey. Let's go to 1 Peter before we go any further. 1 Peter, chapter 1. Starting at verse 1, don't you know who Peter is addressing? And you know that's our first rule of thumb, always determine who's writing and who are they writing to. Well, Peter, the apostle of Israel, an apostle of Israel, he's one of the twelve, and he's writing to Jews, all right? Verse 1 of First Peter 1, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ, and put in the word writing without doing any violence to the Scripture, because that's what he's doing. He's writing to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Well, who were the strangers scattered? Jews who had been chased out of, out of Israel and out of Jerusalem by first Saul's uh, persecution, and, and that was predominantly it, and other things as well. So they are scattered throughout that end of the Roman Empire. All right, now then, just to see who he's addressing, he's writing to Jews. Now look down at verse 9. These Jews were receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now verse 10. Of which his fellow Jews of which salvation the prophets, who? The Old Testament writers, the prophets have inquired. What's the other word for inquired? They were asking. See? They were asking, if not others themselves. Well, what, what, what's this talking about? Who is God addressing? See? And so they inquired and searched the scriptures, see? They were searching the scriptures diligently, and these same prophets now prophesied or foretold things in the future of the grace that should come to you out in the future sometime. Now verse 11. Searching the scriptures, the Old Testament, as much as they had. Searching what? or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them. Now remember, the Holy Spirit has always been the same Spirit. God the Son has always been the same person of the Godhead, only now in the New Testament. We've All right, so what manner of time this Spirit of Christ who was in them, that is, that Holy Spirit, did signify when it testified beforehand, before it ever happened, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now you see what I said? What were the prophets talking about? The suffering. There had to be a sacrifice for sin beyond the animal sacrifices, see? And so, but it was in such veiled language. God didn't expect them to figure it out and they didn't. But for our benefit, now we can go back to Isaiah 53. Let's go back there. I haven't done it in a long time. I've got a lot of Jewish listeners, so maybe this is just for their benefit. Isaiah 53. Now I'm chasing rabbits. I'm sorry. I didn't intend to do this. This was not in my thinking at all when I left home this morning. 
But this is what we have to do. Isaiah 53. Start at verse 1. Now remember what Peter is saying. These Old Testament prophets looked at these verses. They knew there was something here, but they couldn't figure it out. And so they just kept searching and searching. But it wasn't time for them to understand. And so God didn't reveal it. All right, look at it now. Verse 1, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, now here we come. We're talking about the Messiah now, the Son of God, the Christ. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. Now, what's that a reference to? Well, Bethlehem. Who would ever expect a coming king to be born in a stable situation down in the little lowly town of Bethlehem? So it's just like a little piece of grass coming up out on the desert. Insignificant, almost un unknown, see? So he comes as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. In other words, he wasn't born there with a great halo over his head and all the aspects of a king. No, he was in a lowly manger. All right? He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't a great, fantastic, handsome individual that was just drawn because of his physical attributes. No. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty we should desire him. Now, verse 3, here comes the cross now. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, for he was despised, and we esteemed him not. What does that mean? They didn't know who he was. Oh, they should have. He gave them three years of proof, but they couldn't believe it. All right? And so we esteemed him not. Verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, what does that mean? He was the sacrifice not only for the whole nation of Israel, but for the whole human race. Yet we did esteem him stricken, beaten, misused by the Romans. Smitten of God, of course, that was the work of the cross, where all the sin of the world was laid on that sinless one. And he was afflicted. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, sin. He became the supreme sacrifice. He was bruised for our iniquity. He went through it all for the sins, first of Israel, of course, but then for the whole human race. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes, that is, the stripes of the Roman whips, we are healed. Now, that's not talking about physical healing. That's talking about the spiritual. We're dealing with the salvation aspect of that work of the cross, see? Now, verse 6. This is Israel. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. In other words, they just couldn't come together and recognize who this Messiah, born in Bethlehem, growing up in Nazareth, now performing miracles for the last three years. They just couldn't figure out who he was. So now then, reading verse 6, the end, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now verse 7, he was oppressed. This is all a reference to that work of the cross. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb or quiet, so he opens his mouth. Now, as you read this, of course, we can understand. It's after the fact. But can you see how much the Jews of antiquity could get out of this? There was no putting two and two together here. But yet, after the fact, they should be able to see it. And that's usually the vehicle that does bring a Jew to faith. 
they can then see that, yes, this all took place. Absolutely it did. But for those back there at that time, no. They could not figure it out. Then verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? He was cut off. He was put to death. Now remember, in Old Testament economy, who were God's, my people? Israel. Who is Isaiah writing to? Israel. See? But on the other hand, God didn't expect them to understand who this was before the fact. See? And that's why... The, all the, even the followers of Jesus, as it was getting up time for the cross, they didn't understand that he was going to be going the way of the cross. All right, now then, back to 1 Peter. I'm not through there yet. Back to 1 Peter. All right, verse 11 again. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ. See, back there in Isaiah 53, the Holy Spirit was already laying the seeds of this coming work of the cross. But God didn't expect the Jews at that time to understand it, even though they, they tried. Now verse 12, and then we'll move on. Unto whom it was revealed, that is, unto these writers of the Old Testament prophecies, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us. Peter is now writing from his point in time. Now, after the cross had been accomplished, see, and everyone should understand who he was and why he death, died the death that he did. All right? But unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them who have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. Well, now that was a reference, of course, to Pentecost. All right, now while we're back here at Peter anyway, we're going to jump over to chapter 2 because I always use this to allay my... What should I call them? My accusers making too much of Paul. Oh, they think I make too much of Paul. And all I say, well, haven't you ever read 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16? Well, then that shuts them up, see? Because here is the very answer to that accusation. 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 and 16. Come to my defense. If someone says, I won't listen to that guy, he makes too much of Paul. Well, you be ready. Well, if you think he makes too much of Paul, then Peter did worse. <laughs> well, they will never take anything like that and blame Peter, because that's the one they think they're following. But look what Peter says now at the end of his life, just shortly before he's martyred. Verse 15 of chapter 3. Account that the long-suffering, the patience of our Lord is salvation. God is not willing that but brother Paul, according to the wisdom, well, what wisdom is he talking about? These secrets that have been revealed, see? This whole body of truth that was never understood before comes from the pen of this hated apostle. And so Peter has to even tell his Jewish people, look, you go to Paul's epistles because our program is falling away. And indeed it was. The Jewish program was falling through the cracks. And by the time Peter meets his martyr's death, nothing left. The temple would be gone in a couple years. The priesthood would be gone. No more sacrifices. No more temple worship. So what have they got left? Paul's gospel. See, So you go to Paul according to the wisdom given unto him has written unto you as also in all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, speaking in them of these things pertaining to salvation, in which, that is Paul's epistles, are some things hard to be understood. Now, most of you have heard this a hundred times. Some of you out there for the first time. In Paul's epistles, in Peter's thinking, at the end of his life, were still hard to understand. Well, now you've got to remember, what was Peter? A religious Jew under 
the law. And I always point that out when I teach Acts chapter 10. My, when that sheet came down with all those unclean animals and God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Even into the face of God, what did Peter say? No way. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Well, why did he say that? He was a law-keeping Jew. And against all good Jewish sense, Heel prints in the sand from Joppa to Caesarea, and when he gets to the door, what does he tell Cornelius? Cornelius, you know, even you as a pagan Gentile know this much, it's an unlawful thing for me, a Jew, to keep company with a person of another nation. You see that? That was contrary to the Jewish makeup. They didn't have any marching orders to go to the Gentile world, that was Paul's prerogative. But yet Peter says here that all of Paul's epistles now are for even the Jewish people, not just the Gentiles now, and in which, yes, there were things for a good Jew to comprehend. A pagan Gentile can be saved without becoming a proselyte of Judaism? Unheard of. And even when God saved those Gentiles in the house of Cornelius before Peter even finished preaching. And the evidence of it was, was made known. What did those six Jews who went up there with Peter, what was their reaction? What's the word? Astonished. Astonished. Gentiles saved without becoming even a proselyte? You get that? And that just shows the vast distinction from the time of Christ's earthly ministry until this other apostle starts going to the Gentile world. All right? So in all his epistles, speaking in the name of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they who are unlearned, I'm afraid that's most of Christendom, unlearned, unstable, and they twist, and they twist, and they twist, as they do also the other scriptures. Now that statement right there then maintains that if all the rest of the Bible is Scripture, so is Paul's epistles. And then they ridicule it, and they hate it, to their own what? Destruction. The book says it. I didn't. All right, now then, let's go back. Oh my goodness, only got four minutes left, and I ain't even started. <laughs> Ephesians, chapter 3. <laughs> got to get back to what we're talking about. Verse 4, whereby when you read, that is, these Pauline epistles, that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery or the secret things of Christ. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. After all the Old Testament, after his three years of earthly ministry, there are things that were kept secret? How could it? Well, let me just give you one example that I think is the most graphic. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1, another portion many of you heard me teach more than once. But, oh, if this isn't a revelation of this Jesus of Nazareth like no other portion in Scripture, I don't know what is. Colossians chapter 1. We have to start at verse 12 so that we establish who we're talking about. And as we read this, and as I comment on it, just keep asking yourself, is this revealed any place else in Scripture? Does Genesis 1-1 say anything like this? Now, you all know what Genesis 1-1 says. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, period. But now look how the deep, the end of his prayer giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us and prepared us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. See, we covered that in the last half hour. Who, speaking of God the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now that goes back to what we taught a year or two ago, that the body of Christ is in the kingdom of God. Now verse 14. In whom? Well, in who? The Son in the verse ahead. So in the Son... We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. Now here it comes. Here is what I call a revelation of a mystery 
that only comes from the pen of this apostle, who, God the Son, is the image or the visible appearance of what God? The invisible God. Now you've got to remember that when you go back into the Old Testament, God was the invisible three-person God, even though Israel only recognized one God, yet we know that the three were already visible or uh, mentioned and so forth. For example, the Spirit moved on the face of the deep in Genesis 1 and so forth. But to understand that one person of that Godhead did what Paul now gives Christ credit for doing? Uh-uh, you can't find it. Nowhere. Jesus himself never made any descriptive account of how he created everything. He certainly let it be known that he was in control of the elements. He could get up on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a raging storm, and how much did he have to do? Spoke the word. Peace be still, and phew, the wind died down. The sea got calm. And the twelve said, what? What manner of man is this, that even the wind obeys his voice? Now listen, that's not empty words. Can you put yourself in those guys' shoes that particular day? When the waves are beating and the wind is blowing and it's storming like everything and all he says is, peace be still? No wonder they were flabbergasted. And what did they say? What? manner of man is this, that even the wind obeys his voice. Well, why did it? We'll come back to this in the next half hour. Because he's the God of creation. That's why. And I guess it's time for us to wind this down and we'll come back right in the next half hour. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.